Thanks for checking out this video. So this is a type of video I've been thinking about doing for a bit now and finally got the push from uh, a person with the username on YouTube of Future Synth. So shout out to Future Synth for giving me that extra little push to be like, yeah, you know what, go ahead and do this. So um, I think it'll be fun for me. Hopefully it's fun for other people. And if I feel like I had a good time with it and other people enough, enough other people feel like they had a good time, then I'll keep doing this for every single month's releases for Vinegar Syndrome. Now, just so you know, I, it's not going to be every single thing that they released that month, uh, but it'll be whatever I picked up. So this is mainly about the core subscriber included releases, but then I also throw in anything else that I happen to purchase for that month. So those are just kind of like extra, but it's primarily the subscriber releases because I am a subscriber. So just so you know. Uh, off the top, I'm going to tell you for January, I did not pick up Divinity. Uh, and I don't plan to pick it up either. I, I did not pick up Sex Mission, but I do believe I'm going to pick that film up at some point. Uh, so I'll do like a short uh, review on that whenever I do when I've watched it. And I also did not pick up Little Darlings, although I'm thinking about maybe getting it. People let me know how it is in the comments. Uh, or Southern Comfort. I also didn't pick up Southern Comfort because it is a good film. I had seen it before, and I know what, that a lot of people are going to enjoy it, but... It's just not the type of film I feel like I need to own. Uh, it's like a war film, and I, I just don't re-watch those. I'll watch them one time. So since I've already seen it, didn't pick it up. But everything else I'm going to go over, this is my ranked order for those January releases that I got. So my number five, still liked it, still quite enjoyed it, is Santet 1 and 2. I think I was most excited for this one. You can go back, actually, and watch my... Um, haul video of the January releases and see what order I put them in of what I was most to least excited about and see how it differs because it does. But um, yeah, I think I was most excited about this one. So these are two Bollywood films and Bollywood is a very particular thing. So not everyone's going to be into it. I did dig it enough, but there are some aspects of it that really kind of threw me for a loop. Um, it wasn't the music, like the the musical numbers. That's fine. I, I didn't care about that. They're actually kind of catchy and fun, actually. But the first film is definitely the best of the two. The second film tends to meander a lot more. But the first one is mainly about a woman who, in this small town uh, in Indonesia, is um, kind of called a witch by her husband, who kind of has a lot of influence in the town. And he starts to turn people against her and basically in the end by calling her a witch so much she ends up kind of seeking out and becoming one and it's kind of about her revenge which is really interesting so this one is a lot of fun for that reason the first one at least there's some really cool practical effects in it that are super super fun and some of them are kind of goopy there's like a woman who's like a part woman part alligator at one point which is kind of interesting uh and whenever you know She's using her witchy powers is some of the most fun. There are quirky characters in this. There are musical numbers, but that's, you know, those are like Bollywood staples. The second film is okay, and there's good practical effects in that one, but I don't think there's as, there aren't as much, although there is a cool scene involving this image. Um, it's just so meandering. The story is very meandering. They start to focus a lot more on like the quirky side characters than I really think they should. So it just really kills the pacing of the film and it's just not that interesting. Uh, but the first one I think is definitely worth it. So that's why Santet 1 and 2 is my number five. Also the fact that there really aren't any special features on this. There's a commentary track, but I'm going to be honest, I don't really listen to commentary tracks typically because there are a lot of movies that I want to see for the first time and I don't want to watch a movie with someone talking over it for a second viewing. I'd rather just watch the movie. Maybe at some point I will do the commentary tracks, but typically I don't. So I can't really comment on this one. Other than that, it doesn't have any special features. So I'm kind of miffed by that. I thought for sure they'd do like a video essay or something, which I love their video essays. But yeah, so my number five is Santet 1 and 2. Now, I enjoyed the first Santet movie more than the movie, the next one, at my number four slot, but with all the extras that they included with this, I think it put it above Santet for me as a release, and that is the horrible Dr. Hitchcock. 
still an interesting type of film. It's basically about the scientist who is into, we'll call it what it is, necrophilia. He's in the necrophilia or near necrophilia, really. He has like a serum he created that simulates a woman being dead, but he gives his wife too much and then she's dead and then he's got this secret to hide and then he has a new woman in his life and she starts to become suspicious of what's going on and it's, you know, very gothic looking. It's beautiful. I mean, set design is beautiful. It's shot really well. The acting is great. It has Barbara Steele in it, so if you're a Barbara Steele fan, definitely worth checking out for that reason. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff about it. The story is just kind of slow and meandering for me personally. It's okay. Uh, I wasn't huge on it, but I can see where some people would really like this. So um, one of the reasons I put this above Santet is it also has one of these booklets that has a few um, articles in it. One, The first one is Death Becomes Her, um, which I actually have not read these yet, but uh, Death Becomes Her, uh, are those maggots in your eyes or are you just happy to see me? Necrophilia in hor uh, Italian horror films, which sounds very interesting. I'll have to read that at some point. Um, and then The Shadow of the Grave, dissecting the horrible Dr. Hitchcock. So just kind of diving further into it. Um, I don't, typically read the booklets maybe in the future i will start doing that but part of the reason is i'm a super slow reader i don't like to read and when i like when i read i typically am just reading like rue morgue magazine or something and i watch a lot of movies so i don't really take a lot of time to read honestly but you know that's just me uh okay so then as far as the special features on this one go uh kind of talk about what we have um to jog my memory there's two cuts. There's an Italian cut and there's also an American cut on this one, so that's kind of interesting. Um, special features on this, the horrible Dr. Freda. It's an interview with their second assistant director, Marcello Avalone. Uh, that guy was kind of interesting to listen to, kind of a little bit meandering in, in his stories he was telling. Then they have the most honorable Julian Perry, an interview with screenwriter Ernesto Gastaldi. Very interesting. Always like hearing from him. He has a long history of writing a lot of um, a lot of things, uh, a lot of Italian scripts that were interesting in higher profile films nowadays. Uh, Necropolicies and Necrophiliacs, uh, filmmaker Marcelo Avalone on Italian horror and his experiences of working within the genre. That one was okay. Um, and then a scene select commentary track with Barbara Steele, which is moderated by a, a Barbara Steele archivist, Russ Lanier. Um, interesting. And then they always have like trailers and stuff, but... I don't really count those as really special features. It's just, you know, you can find the trailers anywhere. But um, the Barbara Steele part was the most interesting because a lot of people you know, are very familiar with her. She's very iconic, especially when it comes to Italian horror. So to be able to hear her thought on select scenes from the film was actually kind of cool. So it's kind of like snippets of a commentary track in a way, but she didn't do like a full commentary track. So a lot of good special features on this one, and the film's pretty solid. So that's why it's my number four selection. Now my number three. Um, I did purchase this one, and that is Black Cat 1 and 2. There's the flip side of it. Uh, I did enjoy number two more. And from what I've heard, a lot of people kind of feel that way. Sorry, i got to readjust here. A lot of people kind of feel that way that number two is more entertaining. The first one is very much like La Femme Nikita, which I've never seen La Femme Nikita, but a lot of people I've seen online were saying, oh, it's like a La Femme Nikita ripoff. Well, during the special features, two separate people in the special features who are interviewed reference the fact that they were told to watch La Femme Nikita by the filmmakers. So it's definitely for sure that it's like a La Femme Nikita ripoff. They wanted it to be like the Hong Kong version of La Femme Nikita, basically. So, um... I can't compare it because I haven't seen La Femme Nikita, but it's pretty interesting. It's just basically about a woman who's kind of had it enough in life, had enough in life as far as men go. She gets pushed to the brink, and instead of just being like quiet and meek and just taking everything, she blows up and she becomes violent, and then she ends up being taken to prison, and then they, she's very divine in prison, and then they decide that oh, she would be a good kind of contract killer, like an assassin for the government, so they. Uh, 
end up implanting a chip in her at some point and she goes on missions like that's what she does and then in the second movie she's less emotion and actually the film's a lot less about her it's about a new character played by the same guy who played Liu Kang in the um, Mortal Kombat film which I love those films but uh, so it's less about her, so it's less interesting with the whole, like, male, uh, masculine-feminine dynamics in the first one, uh, and that's just more about action, and the action sequences are a lot more fun, it's a lot more grandiose in how they pulled those things off, and it's just, you know, more over-the-top action-y in the second one than the first one, but it's good, uh, both a pretty good time. Uh, so they do have a booklet in this one which has a few articles. They have uh, Watch Out for Shards When Breaking Glass Ceilings, the double standard for female assassins, um, which sound, actually sounds kind of interesting right there. But they do cover that in one of their... Um, they do have a video essay on here, but I'll, t I'll end up talking about that. A lot of pictures of stuff, but I don't understand like having a picture like this. It's a pretty boring picture to put in there. Then they have La Femme Erica, Erica being character's name, so obviously it's about comparisons to La Femme Nikita, so if you want that laid out for you, if you buy this, you can read that. And then pictures, 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 tons of pictures, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So that's the booklet. And then the special features, commentary track with Sam Deegan, historian Sam Deegan, uh, interview with the actress Jade Lung, um, who played the main character, Erica, in the films. Very interesting interview with her. Um, she was even talking about how she got injured on the set. She also talked about the fact that when she started, she didn't know martial arts really. So a lot of the times she would be learning on set, like right before they did it. Uh, so some really interesting anecdotes that she ended up having. Then they also had a interview with martial arts director Ben's Kong Tohoi. Uh, he was also very interesting to hear talk and see, hear, hear his kind of like behind the scenes about how they pulled off some of their um, effects, or sorry, not their effects, but their their action sequences and some of the martial arts. And there was even one interesting thing where he was talking about the fact that he um, was given just like direction as far as like this is light action, medium action, high action, and then he just had to come up with it, with the sequence. And there was even one portion where, where she's supposed to kill someone, and they didn't even say how that's supposed to happen. They just left it up to him to come up with it. So very interesting to hear that stuff from him. Then you have Copycat, Black Cat and Its Influences, video essay by author and historian Alexandra Heller Nicholas. That one's really interesting, uh, making not only comparisons to La Femme Nikita, but comparisons to some other films that it obviously had took inspiration from. So that is why this one is my number three. It's a good one. I'll put that over here. Then we have my number four, which is the Forgotten Gialli Volume 6 box set. I'm a big Giallo fan, so it I'm, it's probably not a surprise to many people who know me that this is high up there for me. This has Death Carries a Cane. Naked You Die, and The Bloodstained Shadow. Um, I'm not going to say too much about the films, really, just because if you know Giallo, a lot of them feel very similar. They have, like, the same trappings and, and uh, formulas to them for the most part. These are, like, in here, like, really tight, though. That's the weird thing. Like, in order to take one in, like, put one in or out of this, I have to take all of them out. It's just very tight. But anyway... So with Death Carries a Cane, this is the first one I'm going to talk about. Um, decent giallo, cool twist to the end. There's a, there's a scene in particular at the very end that I thought was a lot of fun involving a greenhouse. I think the way it was shot was super cool. The way they ratcheted up tension with it was particularly awesome. Um, so I really did like that about this. It's not like the best giallo I've seen, but it's a solid giallo film. Um, it has a commentary track with film historians Eugenio Ercolani, Troy Howarth, and Nathaniel Thompson. Uh, it also has A Life in the Suite, an interview with editor Eugenio Alabiso. That guy would tell so many, like, off-topic stories. He just liked talking, and a lot of the times when he's interviewed, because I think they interviewed him on another one of these, I'll get to it, he's just totally off-topic. And I know it's like, it's not 
vinegar syndrome's fault, but like maybe it wasn't so much usable because you don't really get a whole lot from him. But you know, that's just my feeling on it. So that's Death Carries a Cane. I know a lot of people in the Giallo community were excited for this one to be getting a release. Now, the one I liked the most was Naked You Die. The main reason being it doesn't have a typical feel that Giallo films have. It's actually very, like, upbeat and kind of, like, happy and joyful, which Giallo films are not, like, ever. They're all they're all very much, like, doom and gloom and, like, crimey. Um, and here comes the killer, like, you're, we're going to get killed. It, somehow they have this feeling throughout the entire film that, like, everything's, like, light and cheerful and we're still having a lot of fun even though people are getting offed. <laughs> it's it, it's very weird, but it's super unique and awesome. And there are a lot of interesting performances in this. Uh, Sally Smith is super fun in this film with her character. She's not, like, the main character or anything, but she's pretty cool. There's a lot of fun red herrings, a lot of quirky characters. Um, I just love the whole feel of this film. It was really good. Um, and I've never seen it before, so I was pretty excited about that. Um, they, they have an Italian cut and an English language cut for the, <clears throat> for this one. Excuse me. Commentary track with uh, historians Eugenio Ercolani, uh, Troy Haworth, and Nathaniel Thompson again. Uh, Young, Evil, and Savage, an interview with actress Sally Smith, who I said was phenomenal. And she was a great interview, too. She had a lot of cool things to say. Uh, Schoolgirl Killer, an interview with actress Eleonora Brown. It was cool to get her thoughts. She was a lesser character, but it was cool to get her thoughts on things from the film, especially like her um, the scene where she gets killed. And then uh, Last Shower, an interview with actress Melissa Longo. Also, same thing, interesting to hear from her. She wasn't like a huge character in it, but they do talk about their their um, uh, careers as well. Sorry, it's been one of those days. Uh, then they have Hello Giallo, Death Finds Its Feet, a video essay by uh, Mike, Mike Foster on Naked You Die in the early days of the Giallo film. Very cool, because not only is it about Naked You Die, and how it is very different as far as Giallo goes, but Giallo, some of the the beginnings of like how Giallo got going. So the, there's some a history lesson there that I think a lot of people would enjoy. Uh, and then Giallo Dawson, a video essay by Pierre Maria Bocci on the lesser known films of Naked You Die director Antonio Margariti, aka Anthony Dawson. Um, super cool to hear more about that individual stuff. I think I've only seen like one other Margariti film, which I believe was a Giallo film, but yeah, it was just cool to hear that stuff as well. And then the Bloodstained Shadow, this was my least favorite one, but it, it was pretty solid. Uh, it has the same thing, the same trappings, you know, Black Love Killer, plenty of deaths, quirky characters, the big surprise revealed at the end, all that, which by the way, I really love this artwork. It's super cool. Uh, as far as the special features go, commentary track with the same individuals, uh, Deep Black, an interview with director Antonio Bito, which was awesome. I could listen to Antonio Bito talk all the time. He had a lot to say. It was a pretty long interview. You got a lot of information about how he felt about film and how he um, felt and did making this film. So that was super, super awesome. I really like that. Uh, and I've seen some other of his Giallo films. Uh, Ink Stained Shadow, an interview with screenwriter Marissa Andalo. That one was pretty solid. Uh, Beauty in the Darkness, actress Stefania Cassini, who's interviewed by Antonio Bito, which was cool to just get more Antonio Bito, basically. But she was cool, too, and the way they interacted. Um, uh, rural Horror Hero, actor Lino... Capulicchio interviewed by Antonio Bito, also more Bito, which was fun. Had some interesting things to say on that one. The Bloodstained Set, an interview with production assistant Luciano Lucci. Uh, that one was solid as well. And a Bloodstained Sound, an interview with musician Claudio Simonetti. For people who don't know Claudio Simonetti from Goblin. Uh, so always cool to hear from him and hear his perspective on the musical aspect of these films. So, um... All of that put together, the big reason for me choosing this as the number two, in addition to me just liking Giallo and actually liking all of the films in this box set and thinking that it's one of the better box sets of Giallo they put out, in addition to all of that, a lot of special features, a lot of 
for the most part, really good special features. So there's a lot packed into this. That's my number two release. Then that brings us to my number one release, which is not straight up Vinegar Syndrome. It is uh, Cinematograph, their their newest label, right after DeGosser. And that is Welcome, well, not Welcome to, but Red Rock West, starring Nicolas Cage, has Dennis Hopper in it as well, and Laura Flynn Boyle. This film's awesome. If you're a person who's into neo-noir, neo you should definitely see this. It's basically about um, Nicolas Cage's character who's down on his luck, looking for a job, can't really get one because he has this injury, goes into this, this small town, Red Rock West, and runs into a guy who turns out to be the sheriff who is trying to have his wife killed. And Nick Cage's character gets mistaken for this guy named Lyle from Dallas, who's played by Dennis Hopper. And he goes along with it and accepts money. And it's about how things kind of devolve because he's like, yeah, I kind of want this money, but I don't actually want to kill her. He goes to her and he talks to her and he's like, well, he wants me to kill you. And then she proposes something else. And it's, I don't want to go too much further into it, but you should definitely see it if you've never seen it, especially if you like noir, neo-noir type films. It is so cool. And where, where it's shot looks awesome. It has such a great feel to it, wonderful atmosphere. And Nick Cage is a lot of fun. Dennis Hopper is also a lot of fun. A lot of great acting in this. Really cool story. Great time. I, I really, really enjoyed this one. This was a blind buy for me. Had no idea how it was going to turn out, but I really liked it. So as far as special features, as an interview with director and co-director John Dahl. Um, and a new interview with co-writer John Dahl. Those were great, great to hear from him, all the things he had to say about the making of the film. Um, there was some interesting stuff that came up, kind of like the fact that their stuntman who did one of the stunts actually did injure himself, like broke his leg during one of the scenes, and they actually used that take. So when he gets uh, when he gets injured, you're actually seeing him actually breaking his leg and hearing that, so... That kind of changes the context of that scene for when I watch it again, and I will be watching this again because it's a really good film. A new commentary track with historian Elaine Silver and filmmaker Christopher Coppola. That was a lot of fun kind of talking about neo-noir and talking about the film itself. Desperate Times Call for Desperate Measures, video essay by Chris O'Neill. Again, talking about neo-noir, talking about this film in particular and the importance of it. Um and how it was received versus how it's kind of aged. Archival interview with editor Scott Chestnut, pretty solid, and then caged in archival video essay with Petros Patsilovas, and then new text essay essays by writers Jordane Searles, Keith Phipps, and Justin Law Liberty, because uh, yes, uh, there is like a booklet inside these. It's like included, it's not like a separate thing. But like I said, I haven't really read these. But Lost in America, Red Rock West, The Drifter Noir. The Drifter aspect of it is is super fun. Um, not just the noir. The noir is great too. Uh, New Kid in Town. I don't know. Now that I'm liking this movie so much, maybe I do need to read some of these. Then there's a lot of pictures. Dark Knight of the Soul they have in there. And that might be the last one. Sorry, bear with me on this. There's some great scenes in here like that. Some really cool. The packaging of this is pretty solid, but it smells like cement, like rubber cement. It's terrible. But I don't I don't really care for like the textured like cloth material. I don't know if you can really see it that well. It's like a book. I don't know. I'm I'm not huge on the on the design. It's okay. And then they have one of these things for pulling it out, which you don't need at all. I just don't understand that. But anyway, great release. Outstanding release. That's why it's my number one for this. So that's it. I'm exhausted. Because um, <laughs> I do all these videos in one take, if you can't tell. But let me know your thoughts on this. Also, what you liked from the January releases. And if I should do these videos again uh, for all the other months. Um, yeah, just let me know. But hopefully people enjoyed this. Please do me a favor. You can go ahead and comment, but do me a big favor and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I greatly appreciate that. That really keeps me motivated. It's your best way to pay me back for free content. Um, also, thumbs up 
on this video really helps out with the YouTube al algorithm. So I appreciate that as well. And you can hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos, which I'm doing a lot. But uh, regardless, thanks for taking your time to watch this, especially if you made it to the end of this because a lot of people just drop off at that point. But thank you very much. Uh, and until next time, keep it brutal.